Good evening and welcome, Pastor Lamb, Bible Baptist Church. Uh, it's been a quite an interesting time and era of our spiritual history, going through this virus and this time in our nation, and it's very concerning to, to think about what we're going through and where we're at. Without question, the Lord is in control. Without a question, the Lord will protect and he'll bless you in your life and to work with me and he'll work with you and he'll work with us. And thank God that he loves America. He loves the world. And so we're glad that you're with us tonight. And as you guys are finding your way in and logging on, we're looking for you, trying to get these uh, live streaming perfected and get it so it gets to your house and to your car and to your phone uh, in a way that you can receive it and get the message from it. Um, I don't want you to forget that next Sunday is Easter Sunday, and if at all you have any questions of your health, please stay home. Don't even consider it. But uh, we're going to be having a drive-in service. We'll literally be socially um, acceptable. We'll be separated six feet bodily, and we'll encourage every family to come and stay within the boundary of their cars. Uh, we will post the cars in separations, and uh, we'll have 88. Point nine FM station so you can turn on your radio and hear and control the volume there in your car as you sit there. I think it'll be a fun time. There'll be some things that'll be a lot of fun about it. I'm going to ask you to do some things that you, some things not to do. First of all, don't turn on those heated sleeps and put them back and go to sleep. Don't do that. Don't, don't do that. Just uh, come and enjoy the service that way. And I don't know what the weather will be, but we'll be prepared. Even if it has sprinkles or rains or wind or sun or whatever it is, we'll be prepared for it. So you want to be here and share with that. We'll greet our visitors in a different way, and they'll acknowledge their presence by being with us. And as always, we'll, we'll probably have visitors, and we hope that we do. Maybe you know a family that would uh, enjoy coming to a drive-in service, and they're your friends, and maybe meet them somewhere in town and follow in so they can park right by you, and cars will be 10 feet apart, and they'll be checkerboard in their square so nobody right behind each other and so we're hoping that everybody will be able to see and have real clarity there so we're looking forward to that going to have a good time regarding our ladies um we're glad for you ladies stacy's going to be doing a special series uh the rims of purpose the rhythms of purpose and she'll be doing that tuesday live at 10 o'clock so you want to plug in there and be a part of that and um, stacy is a great speaker and I know that she'll touch your heart and that you'll enjoy the words that she has to say. So you want to be a part of that. Uh, we have just started as a church moving forward to a remodeling section of our church. You say, how big a remodeling? A small home, as you can imagine, 13 small homes. And uh, so it's going to be quite a project for us. And we're still uh, moving towards that, maybe a little slower than normal, but we're going to move towards that direction. On Easter, we've already uh, made plans that we're going to give some kind of a love offering to the Lord's building. And so thank you if you can do that. Thank you for those that have given to the Lord and enabled the Lord's work to go forward. Our missionary monies have been sent out, and uh, uh, they uh, depend on us and those countries of the world and places where we support them. And so thank you so much for your love to the Lord. And it's teaching me some new ways. I don't know if I've got this all figured out. I don't know if I should... Uh, I don't know how to stand or, or dress. I'm just not exactly sure how all this fits together yet. The Lord is growing me as well. And I think it's a test for all of us that we might learn how to do our Christianity um, in a different way, in a, in a strong way. And it makes the demand on me personally and uh, as well you. It takes different kinds of discipline uh, when we have to log in and uh, look up and sit down and shut off and get to the place where we listen to the Lord's word. And I think it's a, it's a great thing. It gives me a new appreciation for the underground church and the, the Christians who are in the persecuted world and how they grow when they're strong. And uh, I'm, I'm grateful that, that we have been called upon in this era of time to walk as Christians in this time. And so before the Lord comes, we're going through something that no one ever could have planned for or projected or had any idea was coming. Five, six months ago, nobody knew that it was going to be coming to America like this. Nobody knew. So we're in it, and you know what? God is able, and God will see us through. And I know some of you are concerned about your employment and uh, monies. Um, I know that. Uh, I know some of our people have lost their jobs. I know that some have no income coming in. And I just know that the Lord will care for you. And uh, it will teach us to pray and teach us to trust. Well, we're just going to be together for a few minutes. There's a couple things that I want you to do. First of all, I want you to let the Lord meet with you. Um, first of all, let the Lord meet with you. Give him permission 
seek him now to meet with you. Ask the Lord to meet with you. And then you meet with him. You on purpose not only allow him to come to you, but you go to him. And we'll share a few minutes tonight together from the Lord's word. <laughs> this morning we talked about the Lord's word in his prayer to the Father. And he allowed us and wanted us to see him. And he wanted us to hear him the words that he said to his Father. He's bargaining back and forth about the sin of man that's going to be put in a vessel. And he's going to take it in himself, and he's going to make the full and final payment for all of our sin, the sin of all mankind. And so he goes to the Father, not that he didn't know the Father's will, not that he wanted to change the Father's will, but literally that he wanted to talk to the Father about his will. And he said, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass for, from me. It says that he came to the point of death at that time, and the angels came and ministered unto him because of the burden that he carried. He did that three times. He called others alongside of him that they would help him through it. It's very interesting. What a lesson to learn, calling on others to help you through. If the Son of God would face the cross in humanity and not in deity, and is 100% man and 100% God, can I say if he'd face it in the strength of man and he asked for others to help him through that difficult time, so you and I must learn that lesson. He didn't invite all the disciples, but only three, the three that he took to the mountain, the mountain of transfiguration. But he sends the eight and leaves them behind and goes on farther and teaches those other three to go with them and pray. And he gave it a time, a limit. He said, now, one hour, guys, and I'll be back. And he got back, and every time he found them sleeping. And he said, guys, you've you got to understand, your, your, your spirit's willing, but your flesh is weak. So we talked this morning about the words of God that he on purpose gave to you and gave to me the, the words that Jesus said to his Father. What words? What a, what a prayer, the prayer of the heart of the Savior. But then, tonight I want to talk to you about some other words, and these words are about the cross. And we're now just one Sunday away from the resurrection, and it's in the boundary of this week that they will arrest him, they will try the Savior, and they will crucify him. And it's about the cross now that he has these sayings. We call them words for the cross. But they're literally sayings, they're sayings that the Lord said while he was about the cross. And I'm going to take a moment to read the scriptures, and we're going to the book of Luke, chapter number 23. And we look to verse number 33, if you would like to look with us and look along. And the Bible says this, And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, they, as the Lord Jesus, two criminals, the Roman soldiers, and they, when they come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the male factors, that's the criminals. One on the right hand and the other on the left. So one on the right side, the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them to ride him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be the Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save yourself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Now what are these words that the Lord shares for us and preserved for us in all eternity from the word of God? What are these words that the Father wants us to hear? Though we couldn't physically be there in Jerusalem, outside of the gate, on that hill called Golgotha, the place of the skull. What are these words that he wants you and I to know and to hear? Understand with me that sometimes we don't need to know more, we need to believe more. There's times that we need to know more, but there's times, my friend, we already know, and sometimes we just need to believe. And tonight, I think that sometimes we need to realize that we just need to believe more. The first thing that I find that becomes very clear in these words for the cross is that he talks, my friend, about the words of pardon. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In specific, he was talking to the Roman soldiers, those, my friend, that drove the spikes in his hand, the size of railroad spikes through his hands and through his feet. He was talking about those, my friend, that laid the cat of nine tails that opened up his back as a farmer would open up a field with, with a plow and fur, fur, putting furrows in the, in the ground. It's very interesting, my friend, that here we find that the Savior, my friend, was, was sharing with us and giving to us a message of forgiveness, a pardon, my friend, of, of sins that they didn't even know they committed. It's very interesting. And then the second thing we find that, that comes from these Sayings from the cross is the Lord's conversation with the thief on the cross. I read this is found also in the book of Luke, verse number 39. And one of the male factors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save yourself and us. 
But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Does I not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due rewards of our deed. But this man has done nothing amiss. And then he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. You know, one of the most amazing portion of scriptures to me about the cross is these words. As we see the assurance of eternal life given to a soul. How important is that for you to have the assurance of eternal life? We find that, my friend, here on the crucifixion early in the event, my friend, of the cross, we find that everything was extreme. There was an extreme sinner. He was now being, if you please, killed, put to death, my friend, by Roman law. Because he broke the law, who did he kill or murder? Or what little girl did he molest? Or what woman did he hurt? Who and what did he, I don't know, God knows. But we find that he was an extreme sinner and he was at the place of death. He only had a short time. He had only a short time to life and to live. It was extreme because he was an extreme sinner, extreme because he was close to eternity. I mean, this man didn't have a lot of time. Just hours, my friend, and he'd be in eternity. Just in a short time, he would be either in heaven or he'd be in hell. And you know what? He was aware of that. And he knew that. And then you find there was an extreme clarity of salvation. You find this sinner has a change of heart. You find this thief on the cross has a change of heart. You find this man that's worthy of death has a change of heart. And he changed completely within his heart. And he cried out. Then he said, Lord Jesus, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. You know, it's interesting that he never publicly confessed his sins that others could hear. He said, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. It's very interesting. It's the clarity of salvation. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. I want you to know that he didn't follow a rite of religion. I want you to know, my friend, he didn't establish, my friend, a walk of righteousness to be saved. I want you to know that he didn't come to church and he didn't get saved and he wasn't baptized and he didn't follow on. He didn't have time. Salvation, my friend, itself stands alone apart, my friend, from all the good and godly works that we need to render to God after we're saved. But the clarity of salvation, the assurance is given, my friend, by the very words of Jesus. The Bible said that Jesus said, after that thief cried out, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. You say, Pastor, I am. That is just too simple. Salvation is too simple for the common man. Salvation, my friend, is so simple, my friend, but it's not without a price. It's, it's, it's so, so amazing because it's such a gift from God that he gives to every man. And the only way that a man can ever be saved is to have this gift to receive the salvation. The clarity of salvation, the assurance come, my friend, by the very audible word of God. He heard, my friend, the Lord Jesus and his words himself. This day shalt thou be with me in paradise. I'm glad, my friend, there wasn't a place that he went. My friend, where he had to work off his sin or someone had to pay him through by the way of masses. I'm glad that, my friend, he had, he had to go to a place, my friend, that was in between heaven and hell. I'm glad that Jesus said, today, you're going to be with me, and that's going to be in paradise. Boy, these words of the cross, God wants us to settle our soul's destination. You know, it's a wonderful thing to have the promise of heaven. It was very extreme. Salvation was very clear. My friend, the sinner was eternally saved. And he was kept, my friend, not by his own power, but by the very power and the strength of God, by the grace of God. You say, but he didn't deserve it. You're exactly right. You say, but he couldn't earn it. You're exactly right. He didn't deserve it. He didn't earn it. My friend, it's a gift to God. And so that's what he does with your soul and my soul. As a young man, when I was saved, it took me a while to get my mind around it because I was trying to not only trust God, but to live and to walk through in holiness in my life. And then when I'd fall or I'd fail or falter, in any way I'd find myself unworthy to be saved. It was only until I realized, my friend, in my head and in my heart, that it was a gift of God and that God offers to a man salvation. And he couldn't keep it and he couldn't keep up with it, but he could, my friend, get it. And God would do the key extreme. And then, my friend, I find there's some other words about the cross. Not in the words, my friend, of, of, of free pardon, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Not only, my friend, the assurance of eternal life, but the assurance of compassion. The Lord Jesus had compassion. His mother was standing there as well with her sister. And the disciple who Jesus loved, the Gospel of John, John's disciple, he looked to his mom about the cross, and he said, Woman, behold thy son. Disciple, behold thy mother. It's very interesting. Mom, I want to give now the account and the care of you unto John. John, 
I'm going to give to you and I'm going to hold you eternally accountable for my mom and care for her. That's something we must not forget that the Lord Jesus, my friend, didn't miss anything about the cross. And one of the things he wanted to hear, my friend, is his tender love, my friend, of his mother. It's very interesting. Now he refers, my friend, to the highest order of life. Yes, his mother physically bore Jesus, the Son of God, in her own vessel, in her own body. Yes, she physically gave human life, my friend, to the body of the Lord Jesus. But that's all she gave. Before, my friend, he was in the womb, my friend, of Mary, my friend. He was on the throne with the Father. Before, my friend, he came, my friend, and huddled in the vessel of his mother. My friend, he was in the presence of God the Father. And, my friend, we hear these words as he refers and makes, my friend, reference, my friend, to the highest order. And that, my friend, yes, my friend, she was a human vessel. But yes, my friend, he is God. Not only her son, but he is God, the Son of God. And then we find, yes, some other words to me that are most fascinating. And that is, my friend, found in the book of Matthew, in chapter number 27. In that, in that place there, we find that the darkness now is about the hour. And darkness comes over all the earth as it never was before. Matthew 27 and verse number 45. And let me just read to you just a couple verses as we make our way into the psalm. And we find here now the Lord in his anguish, and we find now as this time in the crucifixion, he's overcome, my friend, by what is happening. Understand with me that a man does not die on the cross on the way of crucifixion because of the nails in the hands or the feet. Oh, there is some bleeding. Oh, yes, there is probably profuse bleeding. But, my friend, he doesn't die of a lack of blood. A person on the cross, my friend, doesn't die because of that. They die because what happens, my friend, they have to pull up Every time they would breathe their body, they push up with their feet and pull up with their arms to get, a, get another fresh grasp of air in their lungs. And so they die of suffocation, that's what happened. But we find here in these words, it becomes very clear as I read in verse number 45. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. So at 12 o'clock, on the day of the crucifixion, until 3 o'clock, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We find now, my friend, that the Lord never, never grumbled about the pain of the nails or the cat and nine tails. You find that when the, when the thorn of crowns were placed upon the Savior, he said, you'll never find, he complained. You find that he never cried out, as a lamb before a shearer, so he opened not his mouth. But my friend, now he complains, not because of the nails, not because of difficult breathing, not because of the open wounds about his back, not because of blood trickling down his head from the thorn of thorn, corn of thorn, I'll get it, uh, thorns of uh, uh, crowns that were placed about his head. But my friend, now he comes to the place where he literally, uh, he complains in his anguish and he says, Eli, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He makes reference now, my friend, to the to the time of the cup. It's at this very hour at 12 o'clock where now the father turns his back on his son. He turns his back on his son and the son takes upon himself the sins of all mankind. And he takes your sin and my sin. Before you were known or before I was known, before you were born or I was born, born, he reached out and took our sins that were yet future and he took it within himself so that he could offer to us, my friend, the salvation that he wants us to have. The father was fully satisfied with the payment of the Lord Jesus. And so, my friend, as he died, my friend, after the sun came back at the third hour, it was, it was very interesting because it was at this place and at this time, my friend, when, when the Father accepted the payment, and so he knew it. And then he declared in John's Gospel, chapter 19, that he thirsted. They attempted to give Jesus vinegar mingled with gall. It was a narcotic that would ease the pain. It was a very bitter taste to the mouth of the Savior. But it's interesting, people. It's interesting unsaved person, interesting Christian, that Jesus refused to take that drink that they put him, that vinegar mixed with, with gall, that would ease his pain and sedate his mind. He refused it because he faced it. He faced it, my friend, in the strength of the flesh, and he wanted, he wanted to make the complete and full payment. He refused it. And lastly and completely, and we'll be done tonight, that is, my friend, literally that the, the saying from the cross he declared in, the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verse number 30. <clears throat> it is finished. It's finished. It's done. 
He said, I, I've set it out. I've set out to do it, and I walked all the way through it, and I did it. I fulfilled every scripture. I paid all of the price. I redeemed man from all of his sin. And the Bible said it is Jesus declared with a loud voice, not in defeat, not in weakness, though he'd come through a bunch, though he came through a lot, though he'd come to the very door, door of death itself. He declared, now, it is finished. You know what? You, if you would go to heaven tonight and you would ask for the book of life, and you'd ask uh, if there's another book of, of sins for Dan Lamb. It would be very interesting because they would look at my sins and they would find in that book of the record of my sins that there'd be no record of my sins. And if you go to the book of life, you find that my name is wrote there. And so is it, my friend, with everyone that's ever been born of the family of God. Your name's recorded and placed in the Lamb's book of life. You've become a son of God. You, you've had that born-again place, that believing place, that that a place, my friend, when the blood had been applied to you, and when you do that, my friend, from that moment on, you're saved. And so de Jesus declared clearly, my friend, that it is finished. And so God said, okay, now, people, I don't want you ever to forget this, and I'm going to give it to you, and I'm going to record it. I'm going to record it in the eternal word of God. I'm going to give it to you. And as you come to that Easter season of the year, you can visit and review and come to that place where you can rethink these words that I want you to hear. He said, I want you to hear that it's finished. An old story is told, it's a true story, told about the Walamo tribe in Ethiopia. There was a mission, American mission there, missionary there, his name was Raymond Davis. It was a long time ago, it was before World War II, so you can see it's quite a long time, but there was a slave there, and his name was Tigna, T-I-G-N-I-A. Tigna was his name, and he wanted to worship, but he couldn't because he was a slave, and they determined that his freedom could be bought for $12. Sounds like a lot of money back in that day. Not much money today. $12. Now, so the missionary raised the money and bought the slave's freedom. And just a few days after that, World War II broke out, and all the missionaries, my friend, were expelled from Ethiopia. Just a few days later. And so he lost track of the young convert, the black Ethiopian man. 25 years later, he went back looking for Tignia. And he found him, and he drove up in the car, and Tignia was so happy to see him. And he took his hand out of the window, and he kissed his hand, and he made this declaration, and so I give it to you today to share with you. He said, the one who had redeemed me has returned to see me. Can I say that, my friend, the Lord Jesus, the one that has redeemed us, has returned to see us. Can I say the Lord has not only redeemed you, but he's going to return for you. He's going to come and get you. He's going to come and get me. And can I say I'm happy about that, that he not only redeemed us, but he's going to come again and get us. And you know what? This world is not in control. It's still in control. It's not something to be overcome with discouragement and worry, my friend, because the Lord is still in control. And we must not forget that. So you wonder about your love that God shows you. It's a wonderful love. It's an endless love that he has for you and for me. And you know what? He has not forgot you. And so this time of difficult times of confinement in, in our country, in our land, and you just, you just learn to become a disciplined Christian and draw close. I encourage you to study the scriptures and read the scriptures about the Easter sword. Preparing your heart, preparing yourself that you might be, be ready if the Lord should choose to come. Well, uh, we look forward to seeing a Sunday if it's possible and if you feel comfortable with it. We will be very careful with our social distancing. We will stay in our cars. We'll not let you get out and fellowship. We're going to be so very careful with that. And uh, you'll be able to beep your horn to say amen, but we're not going to. And we're not going to, we're not going to let you get out and wander around. And so many of us who want to do that, we're not going to do that. I'm not going to touch you. I love to shake your hands. I, I love them hugs, you know. Uh, but we're not going to do that. We're going to be very careful and protect our health and safety. And so until then... Until we see you on Wednesday night, be with us and uh, join us at that 7 o'clock hour. Be a blessing. We love you. God bless you. And goodbye.